Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Advanced Cognitive Processes. I am Ark Varma from IIT Kanpur. We are already in the seventh week of this course and we have already talked about a variety of things. This course was termed Higher Cognitive Processes because we wanted to talk about things other than perception, attention, memory, which anyways lay the foundation of the cognitive activity that we engage in. So, we have in this course talked about knowledge, categorization, concepts, we have talked about language uh, to a large extent, we have talked about reasoning, decision making, problem solving. So, we have done quite a bit about the higher so called higher cognitive processes by now and in this week I will try and talk about uh, one of the very important aspects of cognition which is also recognized as a very important aspect uh, which kind of affects uh, the operation of so many of these higher cognitive processes if you might call them so. So, to, uh, this week I will talk about cognition and emotion. We will have uh, five lectures talking about various aspects of the interaction between cognition uh, which is the general things like attention, thinking, uh, problem solving, those kind of things, memory and also how emotion or say for example, mood states uh, interact with them and what are their mutual effects on each other. So, let us begin this week and uh, I will try and uh, talk to you about, I will try and draw your attention to the kind of work we have discussed till now. So, if you have paid attention, if you have been following the lectures, you would have noticed that most of this research that we are talking about, most of this research on which a lot of cognitive psychology theory is based has basically been conducted in our laboratories. Uh, it has followed the experimental technique which suppose uh, with the in which the um, attempt is to control all possible sources of variation other than the independent variable other than the major variable that you are interested in manipulating. Now, what that does uh, to this entire uh, setting is that we kind of uh, sometimes end up creating a scenario which is not really like how this uh, you know uh, uh, activity or how this cognitive process would occur in the real life settings. You know in the real life settings there are not so many controls in the real life settings you cannot you do not uh, cordon off so many of the other variables that might you know play a part. So, this is one of the things that has been felt throughout and that is one of the things because a lot of cognitive psychology research or actually most of cognitive psychology research has been done in psychology laboratories. You know laboratories are uh, small rooms where say for example, uh, computer system is kept there, you can do your behavioral tasks there and then you can you know vary uh, the kind of uh, uh, method you will use to look at the data say for example, you can go, go for eye tracking EG or fMRI or wherever. Now, this basically has led to a degree of skepticism uh, in uh, you know people um, within the discipline as well and uh, outside the discipline as well who basically question about the ecological validity of uh, the kind of findings that uh, we are coming up with. And uh, just uh, for people who uh, have uh, who let us say just as a revision talk a little bit about ecological validity as well. Now, by ecological validity what I am actually talking about is the fact that whatever results you have got and you know whichever process you follow to collect that data, whichever process you follow to really come up with those kind of findings, the experimental designs, the participants etcetera, uh, how easy it is or how probable, how possible it is to be able to generalize uh, from your experiment to the real life settings. How uh, say for example, how easy or difficult it is say for example, if I am conducting an experiment here in IIT Kanpur on a bu bunch of you know 20, 30 undergraduate students how from that data I will be able to tell you about you know all people that are there in uh, in Kanpur or maybe all people that are there in India or basically you know the kind of variables we talk about in cognitive psychology. Uh, the assumption is that even if I am doing this uh, experiment here in Kanpur with this bunch of students that I have sampled uh, because of these cognitive because I am talking about these cognitive variables technically I should be able to talk about the whole of humanity using just that kind of sample. This is one of the problems, this is uh, this is basically uh, termed as ecological validity, the generalizability of your data, you know how uh, well your data will uh, kind of uh, uh, extrapolate to uh, larger groups. So, the factors that I have been mentioning have been uh, you know underlined, have been uh, uh, thought to be uh, in some uh, ways impediments in uh, this uh, gross uh, generalizability of the experiments. 
Now, obviously, uh, ecological validity uh, and there is obviously a cost to pay here if you want to really uh, get, get into the, you know, really uh, ecologically valid things, uh, collecting data in uh, less controlled situations, collecting data on a large number of uh, people. Uh, those things do have their own, uh, you know, logistic uh, problems and those things do have their own uh, problems in terms of methodology as well, you know. If you don't control so many variables, you are not going to be sure of what kind of effects, uh, you know, you are getting. So, obviously, there is a trade-off and uh, interestingly, there is an acknowledgement of the fact and there is um, concerned effort in the field of cognitive psychology nowadays that a lot of people are trying to take their experiments as they are on larger groups. A lot of uh, people are trying to say, for example, if your task is a very simple, let us say, a lexical decision task where you have to just look at a word and say whether it is a word, meaningful word or not a word. Uh, I've seen and I'm, I've been coming across studies where they are kind of pushing these tasks to things like, uh, you know, your mobile phones, your P uh, PDAs and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of uh, people are doing, I came across a study uh, uh, some time back where they collected data on 300,000 participants. So, there is that kind of effort. I'll come back to this discussion on cognition and emotion. One of the important aspects uh, of the kind of experiments that uh, are done in cognitive psychology and one of the uh, working assumptions is that all of these people who are coming to our labs, all of these people who are, uh, you know, participating in, in our experiments and giving us data are all in, in a sort of a neutral state of mind. So, you, uh, you assume and sometimes you take that effort to relax a person to make them, uh, you know, uh, you know, make them uh, relax, make them uh, sit well, uh, you know, ask for a glass of water and stuff like that. Make them relax so they are in a neutral state of mood, you know, they are uh, in a good uh, place uh, to be able to do that experiment, sit on that computer for, uh, you know, whatever amount of time. Now, this aspect that we sometimes try and ensure in this aspect that you assume that your participants are in such a state of mind before they are doing these experiments, uh, kind of create a contrast between how they would do these decisions in real lives. Because in the, in the real life, uh, you come across, you uh, take so many of these, uh, you know, uh, decisions, you uh, solve so many of these uh, problems. Uh, in uh, states of mind which are not neutral, I mean, sometimes you're very excited about making particular kinds of decisions. Sometimes you might be really, uh, you know, low. You you've not had a great day, and you're still making a particular decision. So, if cognitive psychology has to talk about all of these things, cognitive psychology has to, uh, in some sense, take account all of these multitude of emotions that somebody goes through before they are engaging in these things. Say, for example, whether it is attention or uh, when you're, whether you're talking about uh, recall of material under memory experiments or whether you're talking about thinking and decision making and problem solving. This is basically one of the things that uh, cognitive psychologists are really looking at. You know, in, in real life settings, say, for example, uh, most uh, it, it is a known fact, it is an accepted fact that most people perform various cognitive functions under the influence of different kinds of emotions. So, if you are coming out with a study uh, which is largely based on uh, people who have performed it in a very neutral state of mind, you will wonder and you know the question also comes that whether these uh, uh, conditions uh, where, wherein you have done your experiment will actually extrapolate to uh, people actually making those decisions out in the field. So, this is, this is where uh, you know the cognition and emotion interaction comes in and what has happened is that psychologists are uh, trying to really uh, even mimic those situations in their labs. So, obviously, there, there are uh, uh, you know there are uh, methodological considerations that you cannot take a lot of your experiments out of the uh, lab uh, directly and obviously, there are efforts at uh, designing experiments which can be. But uh, for the time being, uh, what psychologists have been trying to do is they have been trying to mimic such kind of emotional situations, you know, positive moods, negative moods, excited moods, surprised moods in their labs and maintaining those moods, manipulating those moods of the participant and then asking them to engage with our experimental tasks. So, the idea is that if you want to really check uh, the effects of mood, effects of emotional states on memory, uh, one of the things you might do is you might manipulate the mood of the participants when they come to you. You might uh, expose them to uh, positive uh, stimuli, you might expose them to negative gruesome stimuli, uh, you might uh, irritate them by using particular kinds of ways and you get them in that state of mind before they are actually doing your task. 
and those things have, have been for a long time and people have been trying to study these things. An example is uh, Pe uh, Pecker and colleagues, uh, they did this study in 2009 and they were actually uh, trying to uh, investigate how drivers uh, mental states are. So what they did was they basically found that you know when drivers are listening to sad music or neutral kind of music you know uh, something that is low in uh, arousal or something what they are doing is uh, uh, they report that it is easier to f uh, follow lanes it's easier to stay in the lane easier to drive at a uh, constant speed when drivers are used listening to either sad music or uh, neutral music on the other hand if these drivers were listening to positive happy music chirpy music uh, they actually found it a little bit distracting to you know follow their lanes to stick to their tasks because uh, apparently that uh, that emotional uh, nature of the song is uh, doing something to them it's probably interacting with their concentration it's interacting with their uh, you know executive processes and so on and so forth so this is some of the uh, this is one of the things that uh, people have this these kind of uh, uh, experiments people have been doing and trying to find out uh, what happens with uh, when you do uh, when you uh, induce such kind of mood states. So let us talk a little bit about how, uh, what are the techniques, what are the methods uh, using which people are manipulating mood states. So researchers have constantly tried to manipulate participants mood states uh, to affect the, uh, to, uh, to measure this eff their effect on cognition. So one of the useful methods uh, includes basically asking people to write about or describe personal events that had created intense emotions at some point in time. So Young and colleagues in 2011, rather recently, uh, they used this technique to create angry or sad mood states. They asked participants, uh, you know, to write about things that, made, that have made them angry in the past or write about things that have made them sad in the past. And the idea is when a participant is actually writing uh, a description of such kind of events, the participant is actually, uh, you know, going through, almost uh, going through those kind of uh, uh, situations again and such a mood is already induced. And then you can actually, you know, uh, make them do particular kinds of tasks and you know that uh, the effects of these tasks are very closely related to the mood state that you've induced. Slightly differently, uh, Griskevius, uh, basically, Griskevius, uh, basically, in 2009, uh, he told participants uh, to uh, write about a situation when another person had uh, really taken care of you and have made you feel better and so on and so on. So, this is basically, this kind of uh, descriptions basically um, uh, served to induce the feelings of attachment, induce the feeling of love among the participants. They are, you know, a positive a giving kind of a state. Another method that could be used is to, for example, use music to manipulate states. I mean, I talked about uh, Pecker and colleagues study of 2009, where they were actually, you know, exposing drivers, truck drivers to different kinds of musics. And that is also has been uh, found to be a reliable uh, way of manipulating a participant's mood. So a participant comes to a lab, you ask them to kind of wear headphones and then you kind of play a music, whatever uh, your choice be. And whatever their theory says that, you know, this kind of music induces this kind of mood, this kind of music induces this kind of mood. And according to whatever your theoretical considerations might be, you expose the participant to that kind of music for a given duration. And then after that, you kind of ask them to, uh, you know, perform your task. And your assumption is that uh, whatever results you're going to get are basically very closely linked to the uh, mood state that you've induced. This is one of the methods, uh, very, uh, you know, well-known uh, or say, for example, well-used method. Uh, another method we can talk about is Welton's method. Welton in 1968, he basically asked participants to read emotional sentences that are intended to produce progressively more intense positive or negative feelings. So, uh, other than the production part, which I talked uh, recently, you know, Young and colleagues uh, method, uh, uh, Welton's method basically uh, in, involves participants actually reading passages and reading sentences that are highly emotional and that uh, reading them will basically use that kind of emo uh, emotion. So, uh, this is also one of the methods, you can write small passages and those passages could contain, you kind of, uh, you know, get people to agree on that, okay, uh, six people, ten people agree that this particular sentence here or this two, three, four lines here induce a positive uh, state. So, that is then for positive state, uh, these four, five lines induce a negative state. And then when the participant comes, you ask them to read uh, depending on whatever condition of experiments you want to uh, induce. 
ask them to read these sentences and then go to your task and your task could be completely unrelated uh, it could be basically a visual search task in perception or a memory recall task or say for example a decision making or a problem solving task and because you've induced a negative or a positive or a sad or an irritated mood uh, the kind of decisions they're going to make or the kind of uh, you know search performance or memory performance that they're going to give will be closely related to the mood state that you've induced now i've talked about these methods uh, let me kind of shift to one of the very important aspect uh, a basic aspect in uh, mood studies so uh, there is a lot of effect there is a lot of uh, uh, cross talk between how different kinds of emotional states and we are talking about moods uh, more important uh, more uh, uh, precisely i think uh, the entire week i'll probably be talking about moods more because moods are uh, let me just define them for you moods are transient emotional states that participants or people uh, in general keep going through you know uh, during a course of a day uh, there will be time that you you will feel very happy chirpy and you know uh, motivated say for example early in the morning and you know you plan so many things i'm going to do this that and this is my plan of the day and uh, there are other uh, scenarios say for example uh, you could I feel very sad about in the same day you know so evening something happened and you kind of are sad so these are transient emotional states that people go through throughout the cycle of the day and they don't really last long but the point is that by the uh, you know for the duration they are there they can actually influence the way you are behaving say for example if you're in such a bad mood something is bad has happened you just come out of home or come out of school and then you meet somebody a friend or uh, you know a, a person that you uh, might know of uh and this person waves and says hello and you're su in such a bad mood you don't even reply and you go ahead and this person is going to think okay maybe this guy does not like me but it's just because your mood is not really correct at that point in time so moods are these these kind of states and uh, cognitive psychology research or research looking into emotion has made use of this transient emotional state uh to able to be able to measure uh how these different emotional states might Uh, you know influence people's cognitive uh, functioning so let us try and uh, come back uh, to this i'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the effect or the interaction between mood and attention so one of the first uh, systematic accounts one of the first systematic attempts to understand this interaction between uh, emotion and attention and performance was given by easterbrook way back in uh, 1959 so he gave a particular hypothesis which is better known as easterbrook's hypothesis nowadays and easterbrook's hypothesis proposes that the range of environmental cues you know that get attention the kind of information that you're picking up from the environment uh, reduces as the arousal or anxiety keeps on increasing and this basically leads to what is referred to as you might have heard this term a lot of times tunnel vision if you're very highly aroused you know you're very focused or say for example um, if you are very angry sometimes you know you might not be able to uh, you know attend to so many other cues in the environment you are very happy uh, in that excitement you miss on so many uh, things if you are very sad you're not really interested in so these kind of things when you're generally talking about uh, anxiety or you're generally talking about high arousal this is uh, what uh, you know uh, it takes you to it uh, takes you to what is referred to as tunnel vision you're kind of focusing only on things that are relevant to you that are relevant for your purpose and kind of try and miss uh, you know sometimes decidedly sometimes unknowingly miss out on a lot of uh, other things so a lot of research has supported this idea there is a lot of research evidence and you might look up i'll talk to you about some of the researches uh, today as well uh, that anxiety uh, when you're very anxious when you're kind of you know say for example waiting for something and uh, you know searching for something and those kind of things leads to what is referred to as the narrowing of attention if you're highly anxious you're going to be able to look at particular details but you might miss out on a lot of other relevant details so according to gable and harman jones and they did the study in 2010 anxiety is a negative emotional state high in motivational in intensity because if you are anxious about something you know sometimes you're waiting for someone and at a railway platform and there are so many people there's a lot of uh, crowd over there and because you're anxiously just waiting for this one person uh, there might be two three uh, four other that kind of pass that you might already know but you just didn't pay attention to them you know things like you are uh, you know so many things that are happening because you are just in that heightened uh, state of uh, arousal heightened state of motivational uh, intensity uh, that you kind of uh, leave out all the peripheral information that is not directly relevant to what you're looking for 
So individuals become anxious in uh, different kinds of situations, in threatening situations, and so they are motivated to attend and respond to the source of threat. I am just taking an example from the various other possibilities. So, uh, that is one of the things, if you are highly uh, feeling threatened, then what the idea will be that you are most motivated to respond to the source of threat and nothing else. Uh, let us talk a little bit about how attention might Im, uh, impact your memory performance or how this uh, interaction between emotion and attention and memory really goes uh, plays out. So, uh, Levine and Edelstein uh, in 2009, they actually argue for a slightly modified version of Easterbrook's hypothesis and they say that you know if you kind of modify this one a little bit, it could account for many of the effects that uh, people report of uh, on anxiety or stress on long term memory. And uh, they basically uh, say that you know uh, emotion enhances our memory for information central to our goals. If you are uh, happy or if you are sad and if there is something like that, uh, emotion will this emotional state will uh, you know enhance your memory for the information that is relevant at that point in time, but it impairs it for peripheral or unimportant information. Suppose you are angry at somebody you know, uh, suppose you are very angry at uh, somebody and uh, uh, whatever information about that person uh, is being given, only that is what you are attending, all the other things. O only information that kind of is going to reinforce your anger is uh, being attended, everything else is kind of being left out. These are, these are uh, examples that are possible. Uh, Cabinet and Nixon in uh, 2006, they tried to study the effects of memory on anxiety by you know having skydivers. Now, skydiving is, is, is uh, an activity that can be potentially you know uh, uh, very anxiety provoking. So, what they did was they actually wanted to check the effects of anxiety on memory. So, what they did was they uh, asked skydivers uh, to learn a list of words while on the plane just before they were ab about to dive. So, you know at a height of 8000 feet, you are kind of all geared up you with your parachute and everything else. And at this point in time, uh, these people are asking you to remember a list of words. So, this is one. And uh, the second was the second condition in the control condition, they asked these skydivers to learn the same list of words or a different comparable list of words on the ground. So, when tested on the ground, uh, the total number of uh, words recalled uh, was rather similar in both the conditions, but the balance of what was recalled actually differed a lot. So, uh, the skydivers who had learned the uh, words under stressful conditions, you know, just befo before they were uh, about to jump off the plane and they might have been making so many calculations, they might have been afraid or anxious about the jump. They recognized uh, words uh, mostly uh, you know relevant uh, to uh, 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 skydiving. Uh, the number of words that they recognized, the number of words that they recalled which were irrelevant to skydiving was much few. I mean it was much um, uh, very less as compared to uh, when they were uh, learning these words while they were on the ground. So, these findings suggest that anxiety does increase the focus on relevant stimuli uh, at the expense of non relevant ones. If you are anxious, you will most uh, and this can actually be a vicious cycle of uh, sorts because you are kind of attending to uh, things only that are reinforcing your emotional state in some sense. We can talk about another study by Loftus and colleagues. Uh, another study found that the memory for details was uh, rather poor when eyewitnesses watched a person pointing a gun at a cashier while receiving some money. So, if, if you they are looking at you know there is a you know somebody who is uh, trying to uh, loot the bank and they are uh, pointing a gun at the cashier and receiving some money, uh, a lot of details uh, they would miss, the participants would not remember a lot of details. Uh, memory for the details of the same scene was much better uh, in the unemotional situation when just uh, when you know when this person is just giving out a check and waiting patiently for the cashier to count and give the money back. So, Loftus and uh, colleague they use a very interesting term, they use the term weapons focus to refer to the way in which the weapon attracts the attention because weapon is seen as a source of threat. So, if you detect a weapon somewhere, I mean you are kind of inside uh, in, in yourself primed to keep attending and keep looking at the weapon because uh, you know there is this perception of possible threat and stuff like that. So, uh, this is basically what is something that you know it will kind of uh, ask you to uh, filter out a uh, lot of other peripheral things that you might not really be interested in at that point in time. Now, moving on, uh, Tallarico and colleagues uh, in 2009, they asked participants to recall eight emotional autobiographical memories. So, four events, po positive events that had made that have made you feel happy or calm or in love or positively surprised 
and four negative uh, emotions say for example when you were uh, negatively surprised or you're angry or you're sad or you're afraid of something so four different emotions uh, they were basically us and they found was that there was a very poor memory for peripheral details with memories for negative emotions as compared to positive emotions when uh, they were talking about um, uh, positive memories, they, they could provide a lot of details as well, but when they were talking about negative memories, they would probably talk only about those negative things that happened, only things that were triggering negative thoughts, but not so many of the other details about these memories. So, sad memories, however, were linked uh, with a reasonably good recall of peripheral details, confirming the earlier findings of Gable and Hammond Jones. So, it's no, I mean, obviously, sadness is also a negative emotion, but uh, compared to some other uh, kinds of, uh, you know, uh, negative emotions evoked here, negative surprise, anger, and uh, fear, uh, sadness actually led to better uh, recall of these peripheral details. So, that is one difference you can make that, you know, uh, among the negative emotions, this is one that still kind of maintains your uh, recall of negative emo uh, of peripheral details. Uh, now, learning and memory are directly affected by mood as well. And there could be two approaches that you can take, uh, you know, you in, in trying to understand this interaction. The first is that researchers can manipulate a participant's mood state at the learning time or at the retrieval time. And the second is that researchers can consider the effects on memory of intentionally emotion, uh, emotional events that have happened at the, you know, in the world at large or in the individual's, uh, you know, personal life. So, uh, what kind of highly emotion provoking events have happened and how they have kind of affected your memory, that is one. And the second is, you can obviously, you know, take an individual, uh, manipulate the mood state and see how, you know, uh, the memory of uh, particular things will be. So, we will talk about mood manipulations first, we will talk about the first uh, case first. Now, most people uh, will find themselves recalling far more negative or other than pleasant memories. If you look back in time and if you see in the last 10 years what happened, uh, it is highly probable that you will probably remember more vividly the negative details, I mean the negative uh, uh, events that would have happened as compared to the positive event. Now, when and this is basically uh, something which is like say for example, if you are in a happy state, you will kind of look back and just think of happy memories. When you are in a negative state, when you are sad or angry or you have just had a fight with somebody, uh, you would look back and you will actually find those kind of mem memories coming back. So, depending upon whatever emotional state you are, those kind of information is what you will activate. Now, this phenomena is referred to as the mood congruent memory the kind of mood you are in, the kind of memories you will easily activate. I mean, this is basically the, uh, you know, the equation. So, Miranda and Kullstrom in 2005, uh, they asked adult participants to recall autobiographical memories from childhood and adulthood when presented with pleasant, unpleasant and neutral cues. And they actually found that, you know, uh, they try to induce this uh, they, uh, uh, using uh, happy, sad or in neutral mood as well. And what they actually found was, they did find evidence of mood congruence. They did find evidence of mood congruity. A retrieval of sad memories was facilitated by a sad mood or sad music. And that of happy memories was enhanced by happy mood or happy music. Uh, in a different study, Holland and, uh, and Kensinger, they reviewed the literature about uh, these mood and autobiographical memory interactions. And they basically looked at a lot of studies and they concluded that there is a reliable mood congruent memory effect for positive emotions, while the, uh, the, the kind of results, the level of confidence on the results is slightly lesser when you are talking about negative uh, mood and then mood congruent memory with respect to negative uh, states. So, why should mood congruent memory, uh, you know, be elusive with negative mood? I mean, somebody can ask that, okay, what is happening with the mood congruent memory here? Uh, why are negative states not really producing reliant, uh, reliable results? So, negative mood states, uh, one of the reasons could be that negative mood states are unpleasant and so individuals in such a mood state are uh, motivated to change their mood to a more positive one. They are in internally motivated to change this and they are constantly trying to change this uh, mood state. And what is happening is because of this tussle uh, going on inside the mind of the individual, uh, the mood state is not really, I mean the, uh, the negative memories uh, do not remain as accessible. 
and that is one of the reasons why you will see that the relationship between negative mood states and negative memory being uh, activated is is not really as strong as compared to positive mood states because you are trying to maintain the positive mood state while you're trying to kind of come out of the negative mood state is uh, you know so the correspondence between negative mood and negative memories is not so high uh, as compared to the correspondence between positive mood state and positive memories activation uh, Rusting and Dehart, uh, you know, in 2000, they conducted a study where participants wrote sentences about negative, positive, and neutral words. So they were given this list of words. Uh, some of them were negative words, some of them were positive words, some of them were neutral words, and they were given these. Uh, you know, uh, they were asked to write, make sentences out of this. And after that, participants were put into a negative mood state by thinking about experiencing distressing events. Say so the kind of you know they've asked they've been asked to think about whatever bad has happened in your life just think about it for a while. Uh, then they assigned the participants to three conditions. In one of the conditions they were told to continue focusing on the negative states. Uh, in another condition they engaged in a positive reappraisal of these distressing events. So you know this this bad event happened and then the person is asking you to reappraise it. They, you know look at it in a different light. You know if this uh, thing has happened it's probably for the good you know something good might have also come out of all the bad things that have happened. So the positive reappraisal is there uh, and finally they were basically put on uh, uh, ex unexpected test of free recall. So three things are happening, three conditions are there. And uh, then what happens is that Rusting and Dehart 2000 in uh, to year 2000 fi find this typical mood congruity effect in the continued focus conditions when they continue to focus on the negative thoughts. Uh, in the positive reappraisal condition also the participants showed mood uh, congruity. So they could actually uh, you know uh, get this effects of mood congruity. Now, these effects were obviously much stronger among participants who had indicated previously that they were generally good at regulating you know, and uh, regulating the, uh, these different mood states. So, these people who can regulate mood states perform better and they give better results. Now, uh, just kind of kind trying to uh, sum this one up, uh, the reason that mood congruency effects are hard to find with negative mood states could be because people are constantly trying to improve their mood. So, they are not motivationally interested in uh, maintaining that mood so as to access the negative information. Who wants to really remember negative information, you know, uh, voluntarily. So, uh, what, what could be the possible explanations of this mood congruency effect, you know, they, these may be due to some genuine uh, material advantage for mood congruent material. So, for, for example, uh, the material uh, is, is uh, relevant. Also, uh, there might be interestingly a response bias with individuals, you know, uh, being more willing to report memories uh, matching with their current mood state and less willing to talk about something that is, say for example, if in a very happy state and somebody asks, starts uh, questioning you about uh, negative things in your life, you know, you are probably less reluctant, you will say, okay, I do not remember. Even in experimental situation, say for example, it could be possible that people are not being able to recall and activate because they are not motivated to access that kind of information. If you are very angry, if you are very sad or depressed, then somebody comes and tries, tries to, re, uh, you know, make you remember the positive things, you know, the, the general motivation is not there. Fiedler and colleagues in 2001, they, they tried to, uh, you know, work this out and they could not obtain any evidence for mood congruency effects. Uh, uh, that these mood congruency effects are due to response bias. So, even though that is that's a bit of a possibility, but uh, they did this uh, study and they found that no, they, this was not due to response bias. So, that kind of rules out the response bias based explanation. Now, let me briefly move on to a different kind of a mood uh, effect on memory. Uh, this one is referred to as a mood state dependent memory. Now, MSDM, I will refer to this from now onwards. Now, MSDM is basically the fact that if you have learned particular information in a given mood state, uh, if the at the retrieval point in time you are in the same mood, you will recall that information better. I mean, I, I have kind of discussed these things in the previous course when you were discussing memory in detail. But to just to give you a clue, is suppose you are very anxious and you, you kind of are being told some, some information. Uh, next time you are uh, st uh, similarly anxious, you will be able to recall this information easily. Uh, another example I often give is say for example, you are having a fight with your you know best friend or a wife or partner or something like that and it is it's very interesting that the next time you remember the things that you spoke to each other would probably be in a, sem a similar fight that is uh, going on. You know, so, in, if you are in a similar state when you kind of hear things and you are saying things, uh, the memory for uh, things uh, is better 
if the retrieval point uh, your emotional state is uh, is uh, rather similar so ukros uh, in 1989 uh, reviewed around 40 studies and they said that there was a moderate uh, support for the mood state dependent memory. Uh, these effects were greater obviously for uh, participants in a positive mood than in a negative one for reasons we have already talked about. Now, Aish in 1985 uh, argued that MSDM effects on memory can be explained in a terms of a do it yourself kind of principle. So, the idea is that such effects are more likely to be found when participants generate crucial information for themselves rather than having ex it explicitly presented. So, if you ask participants to generate such kind of memories that, gener that generates their mood uh, of a particular kind, you know, sentence writing or uh, sentence making uh, or describing kind of uh, uh, mood manipulation techniques, uh, then these effects are more reliable, you know. So, that is that's one of the explanations that people have given. Uh, moving on uh, to uh, uh, some of the other studies. So, Neely uh, did this study in 1997 and therein participants learned instructions uh, concerning a given route in uh, happy or uh, sad conditions and then they had their memory tested uh, in the following day in happy or sad conditions. Uh, free recall and cute recall was used. Free recall is when you just ask participant to say something and cute recall is when you give them some cues. The results showed a very strong MSDM effect in free recall. However, when retrieval cues were used, there was no uh, evidence of MSDM. Now, the thing is MSDM uh, or mood state dependence is probably b using mood as a retrieval cue. Now, if you replace that with different uh, retrieval cues, you do not really need to go to uh, moods and that could be one of the reasons why you know the such kind of effects uh, vanish if you are using retrieval cues. You know you remember uh, I have talked about this earlier, uh, Tulwing gave this encoding specificity principle. If you encode something in a particular manner, uh, if you are going to recall it in the same manner, that kind of helps, that helps your memory, that helps the amount of information you can access. So, I think that is all uh, from me about mood attention and mood uh, attention and memory interactions. Uh, we will continue talking about cognition and emotion in the next lecture of the week.